It was a summer's eve. Although the hour was growing late, the last rays of the sun's light still spread across the land. It was a flat land, leveled by the great waters of the Elba that rose and often flooded the marshy plains, the horizon lacking anything of natural significance. It was only the steeples of heavy stone churches that pierced above the green and allowed for those wandering the lands of the Archbishop of Magdeburg a beacon to chase after. It was through this landscape that an old man, bedecked in a long coat, its hem covered in the mud and dust of many lands, wandered. The summer allowed, at least, for an easy crossing of land that even a horse would find difficult in the other months of the year. For a horse, he thought, he should be so lucky. His feet, wrapped in the leather cords of sandals worn too thin, many months and miles prior, ached and bled. But it was a trial, a trial that he believed would bring the change in fortune. Meeting the news in Magdeburg that the bishop, to whom he wished to speak, was not at the residence within the great city with frustration, believing briefly the harsh roads walked as a pauper were over, he reluctantly had continued upon his journey. There is little to break the spirit of man than the news that a journey wished and thought to be over was not in fact at an end. Yet he knew the rewards for his perseverance, so he left the walls of the city behind and continued upon the road north. Through lakes reduced by the summer heat he waded, beneath the great oaks he found shade and rested. He was not a young man, he was not a man even in his prime, but far older and the years of hardship showed upon his face. But soon, soon he saw a rise. It was not a rise like the hills between valleys and the Alps in the south, nor was it a rise like those rolling hills of the west. Rather, it was a lump, a lump of ground that rose slightly above the flat landscape, and naturally, therefore, had been topped with a fortification. A heavy building of stone gathered from fields for miles around and loosely assembled to form a building that acted as much as a palace as it did a defence. To the oaken doors he made his final approach. Exhausted and desperate for a drink, there was not the waters that flowed naturally, but that would quench a different thirst. He fell against the doors and knocked with the little energy that his wizened old hands had left. A window into the door opened and a face appeared. The old man took a sudden step back. Who is it? came a gruff voice. Please, I have travelled far to see the prelate. The old man spoke frailly. The archbishop sleeps, snapped the voice. The old man looked up. Through the metal grating upon the door he could see a pair of eyes staring down upon him, but little else. I only require a moment of his time if you would let me through. I'm telling you, he does not want no vagabonds or strays disturbing him at such an hour, or at any other for that matter. Away with you. Sir, I do not think you understand. I have travelled from the Holy Lands to be here, to tell knowledge of great worth to the Archbishop. Trinkets and tales he does not want to hear, the guard said with increased annoyance. Find someone else to take you in. Then, the old man began humbly. If I may... May I bother you for a small glass of wine, and I will be upon my way. I am just an old man who is in need of some fortification, if he is to continue upon the road ahead. Would you refuse such a simple request, if it were your father? The door bolt echoed hollow within the wood, but to the relief of the old man, the oak doors swung open. I would not. The old man now could see the guard to which the voice was attached. A simple glass. Then you can be upon your way. Into the building the guard brought the old man and into a small side room where there was little more than a long table and a few chairs dotted around. Take a seat. I will find you a cup and bring you some wine. Thank you, sir. You are kind to take in an old man such as myself. Returning with a cup and a jug, the guard set the cup before the old man and poured some red wine. You've been to the Holy Land? The guard asked inquisitively. 
I've been everywhere, from Jerusalem to Accra, Constantinople to the ruins of Carthage. Twenty-nine years I've walked. Twenty-nine years, marveled the guard. Twenty-nine years, repeated the old man in a voice forlorn. As he gazed into the red liquid that filled the cup, he grasped within his hands. And where did you begin? inquired the guard, intrigued to the worldly man before him. Here, replied the old man with a voice that spoke with pride. You're from Magdeburg? Oh, not quite, a gleeful teasing tone laced within his words. Brandenburg? the guard asked as he peered closer towards the stranger before him now, who quickly drank all of the liquid within the cup. Quickly putting the cup back upon the table, his hand drew from within his cloak something metallic that glittered with gold, which he in turn threw into the cup. More so than most. The gold metallic object rang within the bowl until it came to a rest. The guard stared before slowly reaching across to pick up the cup. From within, he pulled the object out. It was a ring. He held it before his eyes and examined it closely. As he turned it, it caught the flickering lights of the candles and reflected rich colors, illuminating the eyes of the guard within against the dark of the room. Finally, the guard's eyes came to rest upon the signet. No, he exclaimed with shock. Would you fetch the archbishop now? the old man asked. With haste, the guard departed, leaving the old man to refill his own cup. It was not long before the guard returned, clasping a candle in his hand and followed behind by a man of middle age dressed in a nightgown, who now carried the ring within his hands. Entering the room, he walked towards the old man and drew a chair out to sit before his gaze. I was just a man when the bearer of this signet ring was laid into the ground. He spoke sternly. The bearer was a man I had met many times, but never would I have expected to see this ring again. Tell me, how did you come across it? I did not, the old man replied. Then if you did not come across it, you surely can only have stolen it from the grave, accused the archbishop with anger at the mere thought of the desecration of a grave. I did not steal it, that would be impossible, the old man retorted calmly. Oh, explained the archbishop, exploding with a rage that had built within but had now travelled to the surface. How is that impossible? Because it is mine, hissed the old man. That cannot be, retorted the bishop. This man, he said brandishing the ring, was laid into the ground twenty-nine years ago. And now he sits before you, returning to his lands 29 years after someone else was laid to rest in his stead. After 29 years of wandering through deserts, forests, mountains, and marshes, I am returned. The archbishop leaned in closer. His hand quickly reached for the candle, and grasping it, he held it close to the old man's leathery face. The archbishop's eyes searched those of the man who sat before him, whilst his hands played with the golden ring within his grasp. The flame flickered and cast deep shadows within the wrinkles of the old man, as the archbishop stared. Voldemar? The archbishop questioned. Achtung, Achtung. Here is the Sendestelle Berlin im Voxhaus. Welcome to the Arctum History Podcast, presented by myself, Simon J. James, and produced by the BerlinTourGuide.com. This week, Voldemar, the greatest con in history. Voldemar, for a long time, believed to have been born in 1291 but today believed to have been born in 1218, was the third-born son of Conrad I, Margrave of Brandenburg and member of the Ascanian family. The Ascanians had ruled over Brandenburg since Albrecht the Bear 
had defeated Yaxa, the Slavic prince who had resided in Kupernik in 1157, and founded the Margrave of Brandenburg. However, the history of Brandenburg, from this point in terms of rule, is as complicated as understanding the Holy Roman Empire itself. Not one member of the family of Ascania ruled at any one time, thus making it so complicated as to say there was not one, but many Margraves of Brandenburg. When Voldemar's great-grandfather, Albrecht II, had died in 1220, after 15 years as Margrave, control over the land should have gone to his two sons, but it was deemed that they were too young to rule, at the ages of seven and five. It was decided first that the Archbishop of Magdeburg should first act as regent, but then Albert's widow, Matilda, took over and ruled until her own death in 1225. At this point, the children were deemed adults and old enough to govern. Johann I was the elder, and Otto III was the younger. Johann and Otto were to rule together, but as they had their own families, the House of Ascania became split into two governing branches. One, the Johann line, became the Margrave of Brandenburg Stendel, and the Ottonian line became Brandenburg Salzwedel. It is to Johann I and Otto III that the founding of Berlin Köln is attributed. It was to the former that Conrad, Voldemar's father, belonged. Conrad was the younger brother of the head of the family, Otto IV, after their father's passing. Otto was a man of splendor who loved the arts of war, of hunting and joyous shows of bravado and competition, so much as to say that his nickname was Otto with the Arrow. Otto, however, was not the oldest. That was Johann II. But Johann was much quieter than Otto, and less is known about him. It seems to be that Conrad followed in Johann's vein, a quiet man who was more inclined to take moments of rest and quiet hunts, rather than the fanfare that his older brother Otto seemed to revel in. Then there was Heinrich, who would also govern, and then the final brother, Eric, who would join the church and rise to be Archbishop of Magdeburg. In 1260, Conrad married a Polish princess by the name of Constanza, and together they would have four children, Johann IV, Otto VII, Voldemar, and a girl, Agnes. It is believed at some point that the young Voldemar must have come into contact or spent time around his powerful and flamboyant uncle Otto, for documents do exist from this time that bear their signatures. It is also more than likely that Voldemar took part in the many wars that his uncle seemed to be part of, be it against Lord Nicholas of Rostock, Prince Wislaw II of Rügen, Duke Heinrich of brunswick grubenhagen Albert II of brunswick wolfenbüttel and Göttingen, or even the bishops of Brandenburg and Havelberg. However, for the once large Ascanian family that ruled over Brandenburg, events transpired that control seemed to be slowly focusing down towards Voldemar. Many of his cousins of the Ottonian line failed to have any children, even his uncle Otto had no direct successor. Voldemar's father died in 1304, and was followed by Voldemar's oldest brother a year later. Then in 1308, the Margrave Hermann from the Etonian brandenburg salzwedel line died, leaving only the six-year-old Johann as the last male member to succeed that branch. Margrave Hermann had arranged with Otto IV, the one with the arrow, that Otto should care for the young Johann. But a group of former councillors to Hermann decided to steal the young Margrave. Otto put trust in his nephew Voldemar to steal the boy back and bring him under his own care. Voldemar set out on his quest and quickly found and took the boy. With Johann in his care, Voldemar became regent of the lands of brandenburg salzwedel line, consolidating power within his own hands, this time through his own hand rather than fate that had led to much of the brandenburg Ascanian house dying childless, including his uncle Otto, who died by the end of the year. Voldemar sought to consolidate his position further and elected to marry Johann's sister, Agnes. Voldemar was now, other than Johann, only in competition with his other uncle, Heinrich, who had a son of the same name, for power in Brandenburg. A family that had once touted 15 male heirs was down to just three. 
through fate and regency, Voldemar had inadvertently come to rule over the lands to the left of the Elba, which were the Altmark, of which Stendhal was the capital, Henneberg and Trangia, and Franconia. Between Elba and Oder, Brandenburg, Lusatia, and a small portion of Meissen, and he even stretched beyond the Oder into the lands of the Neumark, Silesia, Posen, Pomerania, and West Prussia. Even though, due to the lack, they were not old lands belonging to him, but rather many were new acquisitions, there was a lack of cohesion within his area of control. He had risen to become the ruler of a territory that was larger than any other possession of a German imperial prince possessed at the same time. There seemed to be great things ahead for the house of Escania Brandenburg under the rule of the small in stature, but masterful in the chivalric exercises, who had an iron will for glory that he would display in splendor towards his people to emphasize his might. It would not be wrong to believe that this 28-year-old man, who might be considered amongst the most powerful not only in the Germanic lands but within Europe, might be one who could fall into the Actonian trap of absolute power corrupting Absolutely. But Voldemar seemed to be different. He, Voldemar, displayed great skills when it came to politics, taking time and consideration to hear arguments, taking advice from his peers, and passing judgment or making decisions with a cool and educated head. He was practical, understood the power of his presence, but also understood the need to take a step back from heated debate to consolidate and consider his thoughts. But for a man of such power, he did not place himself on a stage that might become the centre of European power. He performed his duties as Margrave within the Holy Roman Empire, but did not have a desire for its throne. He was concerned with his lands rather than those that were far away. He managed to feed the clergy without being too generous or bowing too low. To the nobles he gifted land and power to keep them happy, but reminded them that they were there by his own bidding in order to avoid complacency. When he financed the lavish festivals of his court, he did not spend the money that came from the bank filled by the nobles and the people, but rather from the fruits of his wars or by selling off of lands he controlled far away that mattered not to him militarily or were too already insecure. In 1309 he sold Danzig, Dershau and Schwetz to the Teutonic Knights. All of the areas had other claims on them from Poland or Rügen, or were too volatile. This Voldemar was quickly becoming known to the people across his rule, and where his uncle was remembered as the one with the arrow, soon Voldemar himself would be granted such a distinction as Voldemar the Great. In 1310, Voldemar travelled north to Mecklenburg, where he was to meet in a coalition with the princes of Mecklenburg, Pomerania and Rügen, and the king of Denmark, Eric VI, in a siege of the city of Wismar that had rebelled against its rule, the prince of Mecklenburg. Eric promised splendor and knighthoods to those who joined and arranged for a great tournament to which Voldemar was eager to attend. Arriving, dressed in the finest cloth, Voldemar became the sensation of the party fighting in tournaments and holding himself an equal of the king of Denmark rather than joining the lower ranks of the other German princes. The event was crowned in a feast and afterwards the parties went to war with Wismar, but the forces were not successful. In 1312, Voldemar formed again an alliance with King Eric, this time against Rostock, that had been a Danish possession little more than a hundred years prior, at least until 1161, when Danish king Valdemar I set the town on fire and left it to the German traders to settle. But Rostock had held out against the sieges, as had Wismar, Stralsund, and Greifswald before. The campaign was a long and protracted one. The cities would not fall. Warnemunde, part of Rostock, was surrounded in the spring of the year and held itself for many months, even as the crops failed around and in Denmark a civil uprising due to starvation took place. Finally, the Brandenburgers and Danish won when the town surrendered in December and agreed to pay Voldemar and Eric large sums. Whilst the people of Eric's kingdom were starving, those of Brandenburg were faring quite well. 
Voldemar had substantially increased his wealth, influence, and stability in the area when his southerly opponent, Margrave Friedrich of Meissen, was taken prisoner and offered his freedom in exchange for such a substantial amount of money that it would leave Friedrich paralyzed politically for years to come. More and more areas started to look towards Voldemar to help, so Voldemar began expanding his kingdom in other ways. He acted as a mercenary, coming to the aid of the highest bidder as long as it did not put him or his kingdom in great political danger. He would offer to fight in return for money, or even small areas of land, slowly connecting enclaves to form large territories. However, things changed in 1314. In the preceding year, Voldemar had made concessions to the Polish Duke Vatislav in order to stem the influence of the Teutonic Order that was growing in power. He had ceded Schleiver, Stolp, and Jugendwalde, which had put Vratislav and Voldemar in good stead with one another. But in 1314, Strausund and Greifswald continued their resistance against the power of the coalition force that had captured Warnemunde and eventually Rostock. However, Voldemar, for some reason, perhaps because of Eric's desires on Voldemar's land or the jealousy of the princes, decided to switch sides, joining with Vratislav and the city of Strausund against the prince's coalition. But it seems that Voldemar had miscalculated. Soon others, including members of his own nobility, were declaring themselves for the enemies, and a great war broke out. Voldemar stood fast. Those he had treated well, Vratislav and the once young but now old enough to rule on his own Johann, came to his aid. Battles were fought where victors were hard to choose. Forces advanced and retreated and stalemates seemed to be a common theme. Although the enemies had superior numbers, Voldemar, fighting upon his own lands, knew the territory and was able to move with speed to diminish the effectiveness of their numerical advantage. The war raged for two years, briefly stopping in 1315 before resuming once more. In August 1316, however, the war between the North German princes and Danish alliance with the Margraviate of Brandenburg and its allies came to a head. At the walled city of Granze, today famous for its memorial to the great Queen Louisa, Voldemar would gather his forces and those of his allies. His army seemed superior. They were armoured knights adept at fighting with speed and more than a match for the foot soldiers that Heinrich II de Louvre von Mecklenburg could field. Yet the alliance was aware of the knights in Voldemar's possession that should have easily won the day. So, in a tactical decision to rid Voldemar of such an advantage, the alliance opted to spring a surprise attack. Surprising Voldemar's armies, the knights had no time to make ready their horses and were reduced to fighting on foot. In suits of armour, heavy and immobile, the knights fought. But the light foot soldiers began to come into their own. Heinrich himself was amongst the field of battle, but had to be dragged away after being hit in the helmet by an axe blade before regaining his consciousness and returning to the battle with more vigour and ferociousness than before. Soon the alliance, quick and nimble, had the upper hand, and Voldemar beat a hasty retreat for the town of Granze that lay behind heavily fortified walls. Voldemar had been defeated, and two years later he had to sign the Treaty of Templin, which transferred the rights of Berg Stargard to the Mecklenburg, but in favour of Voldemar preserved the free rights of Strausen, meaning that the war was all rather pointless. It was also in 1317, the year the treaty was signed, that Johann, who had joined Voldemar in the alliance, went to the same way as most of the other Scanians, and died, ending the brandenburg salzwedel line. Voldemar retained his greatness, even in defeat, but he would not have much time to expand or consolidate his land's fervour, for he himself would die in 1319, leaving Heinrich, son of Voldemar's uncle Heinrich, as the last heir to Brandenburg from the Ascanian line, and naturally he died a year later, without an heir, thus ending the Ascanian line of Brandenburg that had begun with Albrecht and to all effective purposes ended with Voldemar. Or did it? You do look like him, the archbishop spoke after the man proclaiming to be the great Voldemar, risen from the dead or not, sat before him. 
Your remembrance of his life is almost, might I say, as if you were him yourself. But if you are him, our great Voldemar, what brings you back after twenty-nine years in absence? And how did you do it? Who rests in the Abbey of Corin in your stead? Death is not complicated, my dear Archbishop, the old man said. Many die every day, and their death as well as their lives are not questioned. Look at me. I am the last of my family's line. How many of my brothers and cousins died before their life was fulfilled, and death stole them so quickly? I merely needed a few who agreed to conceal my intentions to leave a simpler, pious life, and naturally a body to lay in a casket. And your return? the archbishop asked intently. I promised those who knew of my second life that I would return if my former lands needed me. They agreed. Together we cast a copy of the ring you hold in your hand, and it was placed with the body that lies in Corin. The original stayed for twenty-nine years with me. There were times that I starved and thought about selling it, trading it even for a loaf of bread, but I could not. I return because I hear that my lands need me as they lay in the control of a Bavarian. It is true. The Margrave Ludwig of Wittelsbach has found himself unpopular. Those Ascanian of Anhalt that survive are not fond of him. Neither, might I say, as much of the clergy. Ludwig born in 1315, was installed by his father, Ludwig the Holy Roman Emperor, when he was just eight as Margrave. As a matter of strengthening his son's rule, the Holy Roman Emperor had married his son to Princess Margaret, the eldest daughter of the Danish king Christopher II, brother of Eric, whom Voldemar had allied with and fought against. In 1340, Margrethe had died. From here on, Ludwig, ruler of Bavaria, which under his reign had fallen in prestige to a fiefdom, spent the dominant part of his time in Bavaria and the Tyrol. Here Ludwig would marry the already married Margarita Maltasch. Margarita was the daughter of Heinrich von Gurtzia Tyrol, who had been king of Bohemia until Johann I of Bohemia had deposed him. Margarita was forced to marry the new king's son, Johann Heinrich of Luxembourg, in order to stabilize relations. But Margareta had kicked out Johann Heinrich from her lands and was now married again to Ludwig. For Ludwig, this was an attempt to seize the Tyrolean lands for the Wittelsbachs. For the Pope, it was a scandal. The pair were excommunicated and soon all of Europe had heard of Ludwig's deeds against God and the Church. However, bribery bought Ludwig back. But when his father died, he was still banned and could not claim the crown that his father had carried as Holy Roman Emperor. He tried to gain the support of Friedrich II of Meissen, the son of the man that Voldemar had rendered politically void after his capture, but had regained his lands upon the supposed death of Voldemar. But his son Friedrich II was mistrusting of the Bavarian Ludwig and rejected his offer. News grew worse for Ludwig. When the brother of his wife's first husband... Charles was elected king of the Germans and Holy Roman Emperor as Charles IV. Charles had been elected the counter-king of, or anti-king the year prior and had gained support of Saxony Wittenberg, the Counts of Anhalt, the rulers of Mecklenburg, Duke Barnim of Pomerania Stettin, and importantly Otto, Archbishop of Magdeburg, who this Voldemar had approached. The old man was taken to Magdeburg, where he was questioned by the Dukes of Saxony, Counts of Anhalt, and further by the Archbishop, and they all soon proclaimed that this old man was Voldemar, and gathered around him as their cause to fight against the Bavarians. Soon they were marching into the Mark Brandenburg, when other leaders joined and also joined in the proclamation that this was, indeed, the real Voldemar. So Voldemar was back on his throne. Quickly the people, many of which had living memory of the previous rule of Voldemar, came to proclaim their support. Others were not quite as trusting, but accepting him anyway because he was better than a Wittelsbach. The Altmark was on board, 
Then as they march into the lands between the Elba and Oda, the residents there quickly rejected Ludwig and proclaimed the return of the great leader. In towns where people remained friendly to the Wittelsbachs, the people were won over with immense privileges awarded onto them. A month had passed since Voldemar's return, and Ludwig had not sat idly by. He had arranged an army and was now fully on the move with troops already arriving in the Neumark. Some towns suspicious of Voldemar proclaimed their support for Ludwig. Equally, however, Charles IV had also not rested. And a month following Ludwig's movements into Brandenburg, Charles arrived and joined his forces with those that had banded behind Voldemar at Münchenberg. Charles IV recognized Voldemar as leader and gave him his historical lands, minus Lusatia. Voldemar's heirs were recognized as the distant Ascanian branch in the form of the Dukes of Saxony and Anhalt, in case the now 68-year-old did not produce any children of his own. From Münchenberg, the armies marched. Within a day's march, they were laying siege to Frankfurt and the Oder, where Ludwig had placed himself after his advance from the Neumark that lay to the east of the Oder. The siege was abruptly ended when the plague arrived. Charles returned to his home and Voldemar went to Strasbourg, a small town on the banks of a pretty lake to Berlin's northeast. Ludwig pressed and advanced, but quickly decided it would be safer to return home himself and decided to elect a new anti-king to Charles. In January 1349, Count Gunther von Schwarzburg was proclaimed king by the Wittelsbachs. This action spurred Charles to summon the princes that had pledged allegiance to him including Voldemar to Kern, or Cologne, where they swore that they would protect the king, Charles, against this new threat. Meanwhile, the complications of the lands of the Holy Roman Empire got more complicated. The Dukes of Saxony decided to cede any claims they had on the Mark Brandenburg to the Counts of Anhalt, who in exchange gifted their lands to the Dukes of Saxony, thus making the Counts of Anhalt the sole successors of the event of Voldemar's second death. The outmark, however, was gifted as a pledge to Otto, Archbishop of Magdeburg. These complications meant that if Voldemar were to die, many would actually take over the Mark Brandenburg. Ludwig realized he could stand no chance of regaining all territory, so he decided to make his peace. He rejected the man he had proclaimed as anti-king Gunther von Schwarzburg and pledged allegiance to Charles in May 1349. Charles then confirmed Ludwig of his rights, minus the lands of Brandenburg. Charles had no intention of gifting the lands of Brandenburg to the man who had, prior, tried to usurp him. When letters were sent to Charles from towns of Brandenburg that had joined Ludwig in the faltering uprising of the year prior, inquiring over who actually ruled over the Margraviate, Charles made it explicit that he only recognized Voldemar as the ruler of the lands. For Ludwig, Charles's acknowledgement that the lands were Voldemar's and no longer his meant that the only course of action to take to return the lands to his and his family's control was to take up arms. Joining King Valdemar IV of Denmark, who was trying to restore Denmark's own faded glory, and the Duke of Pomerania Stettin, they raised an army that would devastate parts of Charles's ally, the Duke of Mecklenburg's lands, the army would then turn on Berlin. Ludwig's younger half-brother, typically also called Ludwig, but known by the title The Roman, had been installed by Ludwig to represent himself in the Mark and was gaining territory in the Mittelmark region. But a heavy defeat at the hands of Albrecht of Mecklenburg had curtailed the Romans' advances. But the Wittelsbachs, who had, after the death of Louis IV, had had a major falling out with one another, were finding unity in common cause against Voldemar. Soon their joint forces were swelling, and settlements within Brandenburg, which had few resources, were finding it easier to come to agreements with the Wittelsbachs. The Wittelsbachs were gaining in power once again, and it was threatening the status of Charles. For Charles, this old man, who had turned up and announced himself as Voldemar, had run the course of his usefulness and the new direction was decided upon. Charles, on the 7th of February, 1350, ordered a new investigation into his claims of being Voldemar. A week later, the first doubts started to appear. 
court led by Count Palatine, Ruprecht, a friend of Ludwig's, decided to decree, with the coerced support of other princes, that Voldemar was not the real Voldemar. On the 29th of March, Charles informed Berlin and Kern that Voldemar was in fact an imposter. The old man was given a chance to defend himself as Voldemar before the Reichstag in Nuremberg, a judgment day of the 6th of April. If the old man did not show up, then power would automatically be placed back in the hands of Ludwig. Voldemar did not appear. But Charles, even before the decision, had restored power to the Wittelsbachs of Ludwig, Ludwig the Roman and their brother Otto the Lazy, perhaps proving the decision was purely political and about support. Yet this was not the end. Despite being cast aside by Charles, ruled against in Nuremberg, the old man still found support with the Ascanians of Saxony and the Archbishop, leading the Wittelsbachs to have to fight for control still with the sword. A war raged for many years, but the old man who claimed to be the Voldemar just seems to fade away. His name is not mentioned in texts, and it is unsure if the people of Brandenburg who continue to revolt against the Wittelsbachs did so in support of the old man, or, what is more likely, revolted due to the rule of the still excommunicated Ludwig, and the fact that Wittelsbachs had caused much suffering in the lives of the lower classes of Brandenburg. Peace was found and settlements agreed in 1354 and in 1355, in which the Wittelsbachs had to pay their opponents large sums of money. But the old man was not part of these. The old man, who had forever go down as the false of Voldemar, as an imposter, seemed to find safety in the lands of the Counts of Anhalt at Dessau, and almost entirely disappear until on the 10th of May he, still with the title Margravia to Brandenburg, formally renounced rule over Brandenburg. It is believed that he died in Dessau and was buried with the full princely honours by the Counts of Anhalt. The old man has, indeed, gone down in history as a fraud, as an imposter, and is known as the Falsche Voldemar. But there being quite a lack of documentation from the period, it is not a certainty that he was an imposter. Much of the stories that surround him that claim him in fact to be a member of the royal court of the real Voldemar or even the miller that provided flowers of Voldemar's court, came from the German Romanticism period of the late 19th century, when the German national identity was forming itself. In these texts, the Falsche Voldemar is not so much seen as a fraudster, but more akin to a Robin Hood-like character, who takes up the mantle of Voldemar the Great in order to try and liberate the people of Brandenburg from the rule of the excommunicated Wittelsbachs. The story of the Falsch of Vordemar is almost never told within a negative framework, but rather told with gusto and certainly a degree of humour. But if this man, who claimed to have been Voldemar, was in fact an imposter, he may just have performed one of the greatest cons in history. This has been the Arctung History Podcast, written and presented by myself, Simon J. James, and produced by theberlintourguide.com. If you've liked this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating. To find out more about the Arctung History Podcast, visit the website at theberlintourguide.com forward slash History. Follow on social media on Twitter and Instagram at Arctung History, or support on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash History, where for as little as one euro a month you can gain access to our special podcast podcast notes where we look deeper into the episode thank you again for listening to Arctung History History